Luke chapter 19. And we're going to begin a series of Christmas messages that I've entitled, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And I'm using that hymn that we just sung as our theme. You know, hymns are very interesting to study the background of them. It's very educational. That hymn, the original text, the original words which that hymn arose from was written in Latin. And the earliest documentation we have of it was when it was translated from Latin to German in 1710. So it existed long before that. Someone translated it to German. But that theme or that, that musical tune that we just sang originated in 15th century France. So that song that you just sung started in the 16th centuries, at the earliest we know of, and come together through Latin and German and French to us today. It is a reminder of, of the desire for the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, which is what Christmas is really all about. There's probably no other time of year and no other subject that is more convoluted than Christmas. What Christmas really is about is about Jesus the Messiah coming to live among us and to save us. Now this coming of the Messiah is, is what is known as the incarnation. It's what we call Theologically, the incarnation, what does that mean? Well, incarnation means in the flesh. So today, you're here in the flesh. We can talk to you and we can, you can talk to us and we can shake your hand and all of those things. Now, there's, there's some people who are here, I'm sure, only in spirit. They're, they're not here physically, but they tell me I'm with you in spirit. There may be a few of us, we're not even here in spirit. We're just here physically. But this is known literally to be in the flesh. And so what this means is, is that Christ took on full, complete human nature, including a physical body, so he could be part of humanity and he could die to save us. The term Emmanuel arises from the prophecies in the book of Isaiah that are also found in the book of Matthew, when the angel spoke to Joseph in a dream. You will remember Matthew chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Now this is, these two places are the only places Jesus is actually called Emmanuel, but because Jesus was God with us, he would be known as Emmanuel. Now, the Jewish people had prayed and waited for the Messiah to come. You read the early accounts of the gospel, and they're wondering is this the Messiah? Is this the promised one? Is this the one who was to come? But that leads to the question that we want to spend some time answering the next couple of weeks why? Did God come to be with us? What was it that God couldn't do in heaven that he had to come to earth to do? Because basically that's what we're going to talk about. What is it? What's the reason that Jesus, God in the flesh, came to live among us? And today we're going to look at his own words as he gives an explanation of why he came. And that is, he came to seek and to save. The next few weeks we're going to look at this. And we're going to look at why it's still important for us today. Why well, basically it means everything. Everything centers around what God did at Christmas and on the cross. So Luke chapter 19 beginning in verse number 1. Read with me. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, 
but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. Now here's our focal verse. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's pray together this morning. Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of it. And we thank you, Lord, that you came to seek and to save that which was lost because I was one of those that was lost and you sought me. And there's many other people in this room today who know exactly what that means because you sought us. And today in this place, Father, make yourself known. If there's someone here today who doesn't know you, you're seeking them. May they hear your voice today. And we'll give you the praise for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to just talk as we begin about two things that Jesus says in this verse that stand out. And then we'll work our way through this passage. There's one phrase I want you to see. Jesus said, for the Son of Man. The Son of Man. This is the name that Jesus used for himself more often than any other. More than any other name, Jesus called himself the Son of Man. He used it 83 times in the gospel. It was a messianic title. Remember last week some of you were here and we studied back in chapter 18 where Bartimaeus called him Son of David. We said that was a messianic title. It was a reference to Jesus, the Messiah. Here Jesus uses Son of Man. It's also a messianic title. It originated in Daniel chapter 7. And it's a prophecy about the, the glory of the Messiah coming and ruling. And Jesus now calls himself this Son of Man. It emphasized his humility and his humanity but also the fact that he was the glorious Savior. And he says, this Son of Man came to seek and to save. This word seek, it's an interesting word as well. The original word means to move around searching for something. Now we do a lot of searching, don't we? We do a lot of searching. Uh, where do we do most of our searching? Where? Google, there you go, good. Good, thank you. Thank you, we have a winner. Some of you mumblers were not willing to admit it. But we search so much and Google has become so popular, we say, well, I'm going to Google it. Which means I'm going to search and I'm going to do an internet search for it. I'm going to move around on the internet looking for the answers. I do a lot of this actually in sermon preparation quite a bit. I have computer programs also that do a lot of searching of that program to turn up words and phrases and verses and meanings. And I'm sure you have... Some of that yourself. We do a lot of virtual searching. But this word describes physical moving. And Jesus moved a couple of times. One, he moved from heaven to earth. Because the Bible says that Jesus was in the beginning with the Father. And he left heaven and came to earth and took on flesh and dwelt among us. And over and over, the New Testament indicates this doctrine. It teaches us very clearly that Jesus left heaven for a purpose. Paul says it this way in 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Came into the world purposefully to save sinners. But while he was here on earth... Jesus moved from place to place looking for people. He's entering Jericho. Now last week we saw that he encountered the blind man Bartimaeus and he saved him. And now as he's on his way to Jerusalem, which he'll ultimately die on the cross for our sins, he encounters this man Zacchaeus. And this whole interaction with Zacchaeus is summed up in that phrase or that verse, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And from that I want us to see three major truths about 
his coming to seek and save. Number one, I want you to know who he seeks. Who he seeks. The Bible is clear. He seeks the lost. He seeks the lost. Zacchaeus is a picture of that which was lost. Because people are lost. Now, when we speak of loss, we think of being misplaced. We think of being out of place. We think of being some, something being out of sight. We search for all those things. And just, just a few weeks ago, we had the busiest travel days of the year. They say Thanksgiving is the busiest weekend of the year, but we know Christmas is coming, and there's going to be a lot of travel. People will go before. People will go after. They'll go between the New Year's. There's going to be a lot of flying and a lot of driving, and for sure, there's going to be some people getting lost. You ever been lost in an airport? Some of you are honest. Uh, you ever been lost driving? It happens quite a bit. Uh, you get to a place you've never been. Or you go to a place that you've been quite a bit, but they've, they've detoured you and you can't get back. Or, or you, you, here's the easiest way to get lost. Think you know the way. <laughs> That's the easiest way to get lost. Right, is to think you know the way uh, because you're sure to miss a turn then. You don't need the map. You don't need the GPS. You know, there's a lot of people not going to go to heaven because they thought they knew the way. They thought they knew the way. They, they thought they had it under control. And those are the people Jesus is seeking. Those people who are lost. And being lost is not a good feeling when you're out somewhere. You don't know how to get back. When I'm by myself and I'm lost, I always ask for help. When I'm with my wife and I'm lost, I never ask for help. I don't know what the deal is. It's just something happens. But being lost is not a good thing. As a matter of fact, Luke chapter 15, God dedicated a whole chapter to being lost. The whole chapter, Luke 15, is dedicated. He talks about uh, lost sheep. And how that shepherd would look and search for that lost one. He talks about lost silver, how a woman would sweep the house and turn the house upside down looking for that lost silver. He talks about a lost son, how that father would long and wait for that son to come back because God cares about that which is lost. But when Jesus here is speaking of lostness and he uses Zacchaeus as the example, Zacchaeus, he wasn't speaking of being lost geographically or being lost physically because the truth is Zacchaeus wasn't lost that way he was in his own hometown as a matter of fact in this story even they go to his house directly so he knew the way and they go right toward his house they head there so Zacchaeus wasn't physically lost but he was spiritually lost and that's the one that Jesus is seeking so what does it mean to be spiritually lost Two things I want to share with you this morning. One, it means to be separated from God because of sin. To be lost means to be separated from God. It means not to have a relationship, a connection with God. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there's many passages that teach us that all of us are in this condition. We begin our lives actually in this condition. Psalms 51.5, David says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Doesn't mean he was born in a sinful situation. It means David was born with a sin nature. Like all humans, we're born with the nature of sin in us. And it doesn't take long for that to work its way out and to come out. Anyone who's raised children knows this is true. It doesn't take long. I've, I've told you this a hundred times, but think about it. You never have to teach your children to lie or to steal. You never have to teach them to explode in anger. You have to teach them not to. You have to teach them not to lie because the human nature is going to do it. It's going to sin. It's natural. That is because it's in us. We were conceived in sin. But not only that, we chose to sin. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We've chosen our own way. We've chosen our own path. We call it rebellion many times. We choose our own way. We're going to do it our own way. And because of this, there's a result. Isaiah 59, 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Here's a man, Zacchaeus, who was separated from God. Now, Zacchaeus was a tax-collecting Jew. 
This means he wasn't an atheist. He, didn't, he wasn't one who said, I don't believe there's a God at all. He believed in God. He had a religious background. He was a Jew. One of the costs of his sin of being a tax collector was that he was being excluded from his religion because as a tax collector he was working for Rome and the Romans were oppressors of the Jews and so the Jewish people hated tax collectors. Remember a few weeks ago, we talked about the two men who went in the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, one was a tax collector, remember? And the Pharisee prayed that he, wasn't, he was thankful, or he didn't actually thank him. He just prayed, God, I'm, I'm glad I'm not like these fellows, extortionists, which were thieves and robbers. And he said unjust, which were liars and deceivers. And then he said, and tax collectors. And the tax collector had embodied all of that. He was a liar. He was a cheat. He was a thief. He'd do anything for a dollar. But not only that, he worked for Rome and he oppressed the Jewish people. And so therefore he was outside. He was cast out. See, Zacchaeus wasn't an irreligious person. He wasn't a person who hated God in his mind. He wasn't a person who was, who was an atheist who denied the existence of God. He didn't, have, he didn't do any of that. He thought he was a good person. But he had a lot of problems. Just some of the problems we see, Zacchaeus had some personal issues. He probably had some some self-esteem issues. You know, Zacchaeus is the only person in the New Testament that the Bible tells his stature. The Bible says he was of short stature. I often wonder if the guy who wrote that song, Short People Got No Reason to Live, had Zacchaeus in mind. I'm glad the short people here can laugh about that song. Those are mentally healthy people. Zacchaeus might have felt like that. He was probably, uh, he had some personal issues about that. But his, he also carried the guilt of his sin because he was cast out by his community. He had a guilty conscience about the fact that because of his greed, he had broken God's law. He had extorted money from people, which is what tax collectors did. Because what they did was they basically paid for the right to be a tax collector. And Zacchaeus, the Bible says, was a chief tax collector. That means he had several tax collectors working for him. And the Romans, the way they worked it, they said, listen, you pay us a fee and then you go out to collect any amount of taxes you want as long as we get ours. And historically, we know those men and those tax collectors made large sums of money. Zacchaeus, the Bible says, was a rich man. And he had, he had defiled his conscience because of his greed and his love for money. And he had a guilty conscience. But his biggest problem was all, of all was that while he believed in God, he didn't know God. He was separated from the Father. He was separated from a relationship with God because of his sin. And all human beings are separated from God naturally. That's why the Bible says you must be saved. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says we must be saved. Because we're naturally separated from God. The second thing that this means, not only does it mean to be separated from God, but to be lost means to be perishing in sin. To be perishing in sin. Now when we read the word, the English word here, lost, we think of something, as I said, that's misplaced and out of place and not where it should be. And that's certainly part of it. But there's a deeper meaning to the Greek word, which is what the New Testament's written in. This word means to destroy or to perish. The idea is something has been lost. It has perished. Sometimes when there's some kind of shipwreck or plane crash, they may say they were lost at sea. That means they perished at sea. See, today in your home, you have perishables. You have Food in the refrigerator, in the freezer. You have bread on the shelf that has a date. They're perishables. They're only going to last so long. I want to tell you right now, listen, look around this room. All of these souls are marked perishable. There's an expiration date. If you're not saved prior to death, your soul is lost forever. There's a perishableness about us. We are perishing. And this idea is conveyed all through the scriptures. John 3, 16, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life, should not be lost and lost forever. This is why Jesus came, that you and I would not be lost and lost forever. We are lost naturally, but he saves us, so we shall not be lost forever. Zacchaeus was dead in his sins. His soul was perishing. He believed in God. He knew about religion. He knew about God. He knew about the Messiah, but he did not know him. This is going to be the story of many, many Americans. They're going to know about God and about things that they should believe they're going to know they oh well I've heard Jesus died I I believe that but they're going to perish because they haven't personally come to know Jesus as their savior so Zacchaeus was a lost man and Jesus came to seek this perishing lost one so who he seeks Jesus seeks people he seeks the lost secondly let's look at how he seeks Because there is a method to what Jesus is doing here. He's seeking this man Zacchaeus and he's seeking you. I'm here today preaching because Jesus sought me. You're here today as a Christian because Jesus sought you. And so how does he do that? Well, this is... This is uh, pictured for us in this text here in the story of Zacchaeus. Number one, Jesus seeks the lost personally. Personally. Notice verse 5. So Jesus goes, he sees... Zacchaeus up in the tree and verse 5 says this and when Jesus came to the place he looked up and saw him and said to him Zacchaeus make haste and come down for today I must stay at your house the interesting thing that jumps out is Jesus calls him by name we have no indication in any way that they had ever met You read the text, Zacchaeus sought to see who Jesus was. So they had never met. Zacchaeus may have heard about him. He's a miracle worker. He's doing great things. And so he goes out. But but in this situation, there's been no relationship between Jesus and Zacchaeus. But, But Jesus looks up to him and calls him by name and says, Zacchaeus, I'm going home with you. See, Jesus doesn't call groups. He doesn't call blocks of people. Jesus calls individuals. And he speaks to our heart about who we are and where we are. Because becoming a Christian is a personal thing. See, like a lot of things we do in the world, particularly in America, you know, we have, we have a way, we, do, we have rituals and systems and you go through this and it's okay. And it's never anything personal to some of us until God steps in and begins to call you and say, I love you, I've loved you with an everlasting love, but you don't know me and I want you to be mine. I want you to be my child. And he speaks into our heart and he calls us by name and he says, come unto me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. That's what Jesus does and how it, must have, how it must have touched Zacchaeus' heart to hear his name spoken by Jesus. Especially in the way that Jesus spoke it. Not like the other people would have been speaking it. Jesus spoke it with love. Zacchaeus, I'm coming to be with you. The Bible teaches us when we hear God... When we hear God speak, that we're to respond. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 7 says it this way. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. As you hear God speak to you, and he calls you and says, come to me. He calls you and says, trust me. Believe in me. I want to tell you this morning, I'm preaching But I can't save you. My voice can't save you. My calling can't save you. But there's one who God speaks through the Holy Spirit who will speak to your heart and tell you that you do not know me and you need to know Jesus today. And if you hear that voice, do not harden your heart. Jesus personally speaks to us. He calls us. We have to have ears to hear and a heart to respond. Salvation is the most personal thing in the world. You know why? Because God speaks to you in ways that no one else can. About things that no one else knows. There'll be people who get saved and everybody will say, I'm shocked he got saved. Because other people thought he was saved. Or thought she was good. And God speaks into that heart and says, 
come to know me. Trust me. There's people who get saved who people thought would never get saved. But God spoke past their hard heart and their sin. And they listened and trusted. Jesus seeks the lost personally. Thank God. The secondly, not only does he seek the lost personally, Jesus seeks the lost lovingly. Lovingly. When Jesus speaks to Zacchaeus, he says, Make haste and come down from that tree. For today I must stay at your house. And you need to understand, it's hard for us to see that maybe as we read the text, but people didn't go to Zacchaeus' house because he was an outcast, because he was a traitor. People didn't go to his house. None of these people in this city wanted to hang around him. Jesus speaks to him, and there wasn't disgust in his voice when he said it. There wasn't, Jesus wasn't angry at him for being a traitor. Instead, Jesus spoke lovingly to him and said, Hey, Zacchaeus, come on, because I'm going to your house with you today. Now notice, these other people hated Zacchaeus, and they couldn't believe what was happening. Look down in verse 7 with me again. But when they saw it, they, the crowd, the people around, all the, do, all the do-gooders, all the religious people, the people who thought they were good enough to go to heaven without repentance, who thought they were better than Zacchaeus. See, we talked about this a few weeks ago. If there's a group of people that you think you're better than, you're going to despise these people. Well, these people despised this man. Verse 7, but when they saw it, they all complained saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. And that was, they, they said that with disgust. These people complained about him and they actually hated him. And by and large, Zacchaeus had this going for him. Pretty much everybody felt the same way about him. The religious people, the religious leaders didn't like him. The common everyday folks didn't like him. I mean, by the way, he was, he was collecting taxes, so nobody liked him. And Jesus was willing to go against all of that because he loved Zacchaeus. Jesus loves those who other people refuse to love. By the way, let me say this. Those people at work that are jerks, Jesus loves them. Those people in your family, maybe not in your family, in my family, <laughs> Jesus loves them. Some of you are like, oh, I got some in my family too, preacher. I know, I know. Jesus loves them. Those people that nobody loves and wants to love, those people that nobody wants to be around, nobody wanted to be around Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was not going to get a Christmas card from the Lottie Moon Christmas table. Nobody wanted to be around him. So, so Zacchaeus was, you know, he was an outcast and it was a big deal that Jesus would go to him because they all wanted him to feel, they wanted Zacchaeus to feel their hatred. They wanted Zacchaeus to feel their disgust. And Jesus went with him because he loved him. And you may not know God and you may not love God and you may not even want to be here today. As a matter of fact, you may hate having to come regularly, but I want to tell you something, Jesus still loves you. There may be somebody here you say, in church, yes, yes. There's people that go to church because it's the thing to do, because their parents make them, because their wife makes them, because they want to do it for their kids, blah, 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 whatever. But deep down in their heart, they really don't want to know God. They really want to get it over with as soon as they can. And Jesus loves even you. The Bible says, Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That person whose soul is burdened and whose soul is empty, Jesus says, come to me. 1 John 4, 9 says this, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him God has manifested his love toward us. He's shown his love for us by sending his son into the world. And that son has been seeking sinners lovingly. When Jesus called me, he didn't put me down and insult me. But he broke my heart over my sin. But he did it in love. You may be here today, and there's a deep conviction in your heart. And you're like, man, some people, I don't like to come to church because of the way I feel when I come to church. That's because God loves you, and he wants you to know his grace. But he wants you to realize you must repent of your sins and believe in him. 
Jesus loves us enough to tell us the truth and to deal with that which separates us from God. And so Jesus is going to speak to this man and go home with this man personally and lovingly. Number three. So who he seeks and how he seeks. Let's look at the third and final thing here this morning. Why he seeks. Why did Emmanuel come? And coming, why did he go through this life and still today by the power of his spirit seek people? Well, Jesus tells us it is to save. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. What does it mean? What does it mean when he says to save? We talk about it all the time. You may have heard it, but you don't have any idea what it means. I mean, I've heard people even mock it out of ignorance because they don't know what it means. Well, what does it mean Jesus is going to save me? I don't need saving. And somewhere in this story, between verses 6 and 8, Zacchaeus is saved. He comes to this knowledge of God. He comes to this knowledge of Christ and who he is and and why he needs him. And I want to tell you this morning, this is important. If you're ever going to be saved, you have to come to this knowledge personally. You have to come to know why you need to be saved and how you can be saved. So what does it mean? What salvation means? What does it mean? Number one, it means to deliver or rescue from perishing. It means to deliver or rescue from perishing. It is a great picture. It is actually the the word in the New Testament is a heroic word. It pictures one who rescues, who snatches one from this perishing, this, this expiration date on our souls. It pictures one who rushes in and delivers us. The enemy wants to destroy us. Sin wants to destroy us. And there's one who comes in and who rescues us. Jesus came into this world to rescue us and deliver us from our own sin. He came to rescue us from the wages of sin, which is death, and to give us life and to give it more abundantly. And when we talk about perishing and we talk about this this rescuing, you know, sin is an interesting thing because it destroys us, but it doesn't have to be dramatic and painful and torturous. See, in one sense, if sin was like fire, we'd get the lesson. You stuck your hand in the fire, you got burned immediately, you pull your hand out. Even that little child we were talking about, they learned that lesson. They may not listen to you and say, don't touch that, it's hot. But they listen to that when they touch it. If sin was that way, we would learn. But it's not that way always. Sin destroys us in a much more subtle way. It's not so dramatic. As a matter of fact, sin can be destroying us. And our answer is to go deeper into it. To go further into it. To sin more. Maybe that will make it better. That's the way human beings think. Sometimes, you know, sin... Destruction can be comforted by the world's goods. Zacchaeus had been comforted for a while because he was a rich man. He had a lot of pleasures. It kept him from dealing with his problem. Sin can be deadened by religious activity and moral goodness. A lot of people's sin is deadened because I go to church. I've been, I've been through this class and that class and I got baptized and I went through the next level and I did this and I did that. All the while they've never dealt with their sin issue but they've added religious stuff to it and so sin is deadened for a while. We don't feel its effects because we think, well, I've done this religious stuff. And sin can even be ignored for a while because of all the distractions of life. But I want to tell you something. The only way to overcome sin is to come to Jesus. You can be deadened by it and distracted from it and ignore it for a while, but you cannot overcome it apart from Jesus. Jesus, in fact, in Luke 13, 3 said, Except you repent, you will all likewise perish. The only way to be rescued is to come to God and place your faith in Jesus. And that leads us to the second thing I want you to see, how salvation is received. Two things I want you to see that Zacchaeus had in his life that you must have in your life if you're going to truly come to Jesus. Number one, you have to receive him through faith. You have to receive him through faith. So Jesus comes and he tells Zacchaeus, get down and come make haste. We're going to your house. And the Bible says he did what Jesus told him. That's a good start. Verse 6, so he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. That's a good start. So Jesus is telling you something today. Do what he says. That's a good start. 
But when they, when they saw it, verse 7 tells the people all complained. And then down in verse 8, Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here's an important point. All these people were complaining about Jesus going to be with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus stood up and called Jesus Lord. This is the confession of faith. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And if you cannot confess that Jesus is Lord, you cannot be saved. There's a lot of people in the world who believe in Jesus. Jesus is just one of the many ways. He's your way, but I got my way over here. But listen, there's not a Baptist way or a Christian way or a Muslim way or a Buddhist way. There's a Jesus way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And you have to confess that Jesus is Lord. You have to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And you shall be saved. And without that confession, without Jesus ever being Lord, you will never be saved. Zacchaeus stood up in front of all these people who actually were hating on him. And hating Jesus and putting Jesus down and putting Zacchaeus down. And it didn't bother him. He just didn't care because he's in that moment with Jesus. And let me tell you, when you get under conviction, you won't worry about who's at church. You'll just give your heart to Jesus. You won't worry about what somebody will think. You'll give your heart to Jesus. Zacchaeus received a lot more hostility in this passage than you ever receive at church. If you can't be saved here, I don't know where you're going to be saved. Because it's easy to get saved here. Zacchaeus had people speaking against him. And he made the confession of faith. Look, Lord, he placed his faith in Jesus. He confessed with his mouth that Jesus is Lord and God had mercy on him. You must have faith. And it's not enough to believe there's a God in heaven. It's not enough to believe that, um, that God created everything. That's all good. But you have to personally put your faith in Jesus that he died for you, that he rose again, and that he and he alone can forgive you. Through faith. And then the second part of that, the, the other side of the coin. There's two sides of this salvation coin. Faith, through faith, and through repentance. Zacchaeus called Jesus Lord there in verse 8. And look what he says. Look, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Here's the deal. Of course Zacchaeus had taken things by false accusation. That's what tax collectors did. Of course he had. And he says, listen, his heart, he said, Lord, I, 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 I want to give, I want to give, I want to restore this, I want to repent. I don't want to be known as a man who has taken advantage of these people. So he says, I'm going to restore fourfold. You know what that means? That means if he owed $250, he put out 1000 Because he had lived in sin for so long. His heart needed to turn back to God. He wanted to do good and he wanted to get right. He's repenting of his sin. He's acknowledging his own personal need and his willingness, his willingness to give up that which had cost him, had caused him the problems in the first place. See, this is repentance. A lot of people you know believe in God. A lot of people you know believe in Jesus. But not near as many people that you know have really repented. And there is a difference. This is why we wonder, well, I talked to this person and they don't have any interest in God. They don't have any interest in church. They don't have any, they're living an ungodly life. But they say they believe. Well, sure they do. But faith without repentance is useless. Except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Today... Jesus came to seek and to save. The incarnation happened to bring salvation. To seek and to save. This morning, I want to ask you, has there ever come a time in your life when you trusted Christ as your Savior? Jesus Christ loves you. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrated his love for you on the cross. Have you ever placed your faith in his son? Have you ever 
repented and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, I acknowledge to you that I'm a sinner. The Bible says repent. Acts 3, 19, repent then and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out and times of refreshing may come from the Lord. That means God will cover your sin and refresh your soul. Repent and believe. I quoted this verse earlier, Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Today, if that's never happened for you, today is the day. Come to Christ. Today, if it has happened and you know you're a saved person, but maybe you've been walking and busy and you're away from God and you're walking at a guilty distance, I want to ask you to come back. Jesus came to seek you. He wants you to walk with him. He doesn't want his relationship with you to be a long gone memory of something that happened in the past, but a daily reality of something that happens in the present. Come to him today. Some of you need to be saved. Today is the day.